had an awesome uh, President's Day weekend last week, and you're feeling rested and ready for more faces and places and fashion. Uh, today is a little bit of a unique day. I wanted to bring some different voices from around the world for you guys this semester since we're remote, and usually this class is live, and I'm a lot more limited to who can show up in person in New York City. Um, and one of the contacts that I was able to book for us is based out of Shanghai, which is amazing and so great that she can be here and be part of it. But at the same time, right now in Shanghai is 13 hours ahead, so it's five in the morning. Um, so what I did was actually pre-record my portion of the interview with her, and then she's going to be joining us live at 5.30 our time so she can answer all of your dying and burning questions. So um, hopefully everything will work okay with technology um, as far as the video, but you guys will have to let me know when we get there. And also a really exciting part of today's class that we'll be kicking off with is um, some cultural fellows who are joining us also from Asia uh, with experience in Asia so they can talk to us a little bit about what it's like to work in their corner of the world. Before we get to Joyce and Ezekiel, I just want to uh, touch base on a couple of things about our attendance process. Um, it at, starts at 410. On-time attendance is pulled from the class log. And if you're late, um, you will be marked as late as such. Um, make sure your name is displayed properly. Everything has been going smoothly with this. I do update every single week, so check in on your attendance. And if you have any call-outs or concerns, let me know as soon as possible. Just a reminder on remote guidelines, please be sure to raise your hand if you want to speak. And if you have any immediate or pressing questions, always use the chat function. I'm checking it regularly. Um, if you are speaking, we would all appreciate it if you would turn your camera on. And if you will raise your hand, please preemptively turn on your camera. Unmute only when you're about to speak. And this class is being recorded. May I ask something, Professor? Yes, you have a question? Yeah. Yes, uh, I, I maybe misunderstood that uh, questioning, uh, uh, like uh, questions, uh, like we have to email you before that que we, are question we have questions for uh, our guests, or I, uh, I don't know, I'm like, uh, yes. Please. So for, for lecture prep questions, for your assignment, the two different lecture prep questions that you need to turn in, there is a template posted on Blackboard under content, it's a Word document, you need to fill that out ahead of class and send it to me. And then ask one of those questions during class and send it back to me on that same template. Template. Does that make sense? Of course, mm -hmm. if you have a question day of and you're not doing the assignment, you can always ask questions whenever you feel like it. But oh, okay. um, two different times you are required to do the lecture prep questions to make sure that you prepare some questions in advance of class. Does that oh, make sense? Okay. Thank, thank you, yes. Yeah, OK, great. Um, since I just skipped ahead, I'll just finish on this slide first and then go back. Um, so be sure to email us before class the day that it's due, but also write back to me on the same email chain so that I have a clear path that you had, had emailed in advance. Um, and, and moving backwards, the fashion event critiques, they're due next week. You have to attend two fashion-related exhibits, view documentaries or events this semester, and um, these can be com these should be completely submitted through Blackboard. The links are live on Blackboard. Does anyone have questions as you've been going through these, and doing them? So they're due next week by 4:10. Um, I look forward to reading what you guys did. Okay, just a reminder on social media. Um, Hawa. I wanted to ask, so when we write our critiques, what kind of outlines do we put them, not the critiques, oh, they are the critiques, right? When you answer the questions from the guests, how do we, what kind of structure do we, do you want them in? Fashion event critiques is a link oh, on no, Blackboard. Okay, no, the fashion and critiques is a link on Blackboard. The lecture prep questions are also have a template. The lecture prep question template is posted on Blackboard in a Word document. Okay. So you just download that document, fill in your questions, and send it back to me. And but when we we um, when we answer them back, like answer all our four questions back, or just choose one. It says on this document, choose one. 
Answer yeah, one of the questions in the class. One. Yeah, you just need to choose one. And then email back to you? Or and then email it back to me. Yep. Okay. okay. Email it back to Thank me. You. Write down your answer. So this is this question is but this uh, assignment has been adapted. Usually you would be in person and you would ask your question in person. You would write down your answer while you're in class and and just hand it to me as you walk out of class. Obviously, since we can't do that, um, I've tried to make a workaround, which is just that you prepare the questions in advance, but you still need to write down or you know type up your answer that you asked and send it back to me. Does that make sense? It does, thank you. Okay, no problem. So again, a reminder on social media, um, follow along on Instagram at Prof Caroline FIT or on Twitter at Faces and Places FIT. There is also a Facebook page and you can always view our classes after the fact on YouTube, as well as check out um, any previous semesters that I have posted. Quick flash of our schedule. As mentioned, we have Kate Sullivan here with us today and our cultural fellows. So kind of an Asia infusion uh, for the day. Next week, we have a costume designer, Katie Irish, joining us. She is primarily in television and film, although she did do start in theater. She's most well known for doing the costumes for the Americans. Very exciting to have her on. Uh, Laura Wales Holiday will be joining us the following week. She's a marketing consultant. She's working with Depop currently, but she was previously with two startups, Zola and Rent the Runway. Uh, has a really great and fresh perspective on what it's like to join a startup. Week seven, we will not have live class as your midterm will be due, um, uh, and you will have a week to complete that. So uh, as of March 8th, it will be live after class, and you can complete it during the week. And um, it should take you about the, the time of class, which is why I will not have class on the seventh, week seven, 315. Uh, week 8, 322, we will have in Karen Sabak, who is a designer in bridal wear. She has her own uh, company and two different locations based in Brooklyn and Long Island. She's got a really great uh, eye, and she also will take us through her showroom, which is super exciting to see. And then March 29th, we have spring break, and April 5th, Zeta Musa, who's a design director at Betsy Johnson Kids, is joining us. Week 10, Dimitri Demetra Williams, who is an alumni of FIT and is a founder and CEO of Mitra, will be joining us. She's also a designer at Helmet Lang. So I think it'll be great for you guys to talk to someone who's relatively new graduate on how they are managing uh, corporate life as well as building their own company. Week 11, uh, Bijou Abiola from L'Oreal will be joining us. Um, and week 12, Oana Botez, who's a costume, costume designer in theater, opera, and dance, will all be joining us. And on May 3rd, Rachel Landy, Vice President of Global Merchandising at Kate Spade, will be coming. And our last week of lectures will be May 10th with the Fashion Services Network. They will be doing a panel with us. Does anyone have questions on the schedule? No, I usually graze over it, but okay. Great. Well, with that, I would love to welcome our cultural fellows. Uh, first, uh, Ezekiel Edwards. I think you may go by Zeke. Oh, Justin, do you have a question? No, I just don't know what I'm clicking over here. I'm sorry. Okay, okay, cool. Um, Zeke, are you there? I'm here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course. Yes. Happy to be here. Um, if you could just tell us a little bit about your background and where you where you're from and where you've worked and sure. Any you might have. Um, so I am an FIT student. I study entrepreneurship. I'm in my sixth semester and um, along with Joyce, I am a cultural fellow. So um, you may or may not be familiar with the cultural fellows. We um, are international students or students with significant experience living and studying overseas. And um, we work on campus in a variety of capacities, but um, usually with international students during orientation and um, throughout the year during different events, um, have a whole bunch of different roles that we kind of do. Um, but before moving to New York City to um, attend FIT, I was living in Hanoi, Vietnam. I don't know if any of you guys have ever been to that part of the world. I highly recommend it when you can travel again. Um, and I went to an international school there. I went to the United Nations International School. Uh, I lived there for nine years. 
And that's really where I kind of established my interest in fashion and um, started my own clothing brand there, um, which I kind of ran throughout high school. Um, and obviously a lot of product is made in Vietnam, so it wasn't um, particularly difficult to source product or work with manufacturers. Um, there's easier access, I would say, and affordable access. Um, but kind of more professional experience, which might relate or provide greater insight to you guys as students in this course, is um, I worked with um, a luxury goods distributor in Southeast Asia. So for those of you who maybe aren't familiar how kind of international supply chain works, usually luxury brands partner with regional distributors um, to kind of get a better insight into the market, given that they, you know, if it's like you Saint Laurent, they're in Paris, they may not know the Vietnamese market, as well as um, the company that I was with, which was based in Vietnam. Um, so we worked with a variety of luxury brands in high jewelry and luxury um, leather goods. So um, the brands that we partnered with were Bottega Veneta, Hermes, um, Yves Saint Laurent, uh, Kenzo, Hugo Boss. Um, so a handful of luxury brands. And what we essentially did was I was in the marketing team um, and we devised kind of... Um, you know, regional marketing plans that would be relevant to um, local clients, regional clients, um, and kind of the taste and preferences of those markets. Because somebody who shops um, Hermes in New York is not really looking for the same thing um, as the clients who are shopping for Hermes in Hanoi, Vietnam. Um, and yes, there are people who shop for Hermes in Hanoi, Vietnam, whether you knew it or not. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, um, I did a variety of different things, marketing plan related development. Um, we did a lot of um, press, press related um, work. So developing press releases, compiling reports on industry trends, kind of um, regional industry trends. Um, we did social media management and strategy for um, for luxury brands, so like Hermes or Saint Laurent will have, you know, a Vietnam account um, that is, you know, translated into Vietnamese and has content created specifically for that market. Um, and planning and implementation of consumer facing um, events, campaigns and projects. So uh, back in the day when there was actually in person events, which is maybe hard to <laughs> think back to at this point, but we did a lot of um, event preparation and um, really building brand awareness is essentially what it came down to because these were big luxury brands, but they weren't very well known or, or um, super accessible um, given they were so new to the market. So really what we were doing was building brand awareness. Um, and that's kind of the gist of it, I would say. Great, yeah. super interesting. Um, since you've been, you're on your, do you say your sixth semester? Yes, your third yes. year, right? Um, yeah. mm -hmm. So have you had an opportunity to work in New York City since you've been here? Yes, I have. Um, I just finished an internship with um, Proenza, Proenza Schooler, wholesale related internship. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. Here's Cafe Resident Services. There's my Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know if you could talk to us a little bit about your, you know, your impressions, your differences in working in the two different cities. Um, anything that yeah. you can share? Yeah, the comparison between the two, that's a good question. Um, so I think the Vietnamese, well, I, most of my work experience has been in kind of um, contemporary or luxury, luxury fashion. Um, so it's, I guess the noteworthy differences would be um, the, in Vietnam, at least, the clientele for luxury is obviously very small. It's very small all over the world. But, um, you know, this is a developing country where, you know, the top 0.0001% um, of the population really hold a vast amount of wealth, like the lion's share of the country's wealth. So they have really, really... Um, high levels of expendable income and 
um, when you're working with luxury brands, you know, these are clients that are particularly discerning um, in their tastes and preferences. So, um, and, but they also have a lot of cash. So you want to make sure, you know, when I'm, I'm talking about the Vietnamese market right now, but you kind of have to craft out a unique strategy that um, involves introducing the brand to them, building a personal relationship, because obviously in that part of the world, um, or in the Vietnamese market, I can speak to specifically, building, pers the brand has to build kind of a trusted relationship with the client and um, a continued relationship with the client. Um, and I know working in the US or working in New York, at least we're surrounded by all these fashion brands. So we're all very familiar with them. Um, the Vietnamese market was, you know, very kind of green to that. So um, that would be the stark difference was there was a lot of investment into um, customer acquisition. So that they knew about us. Yeah. So yeah, that's super interesting. Um, how about office life? Was um, hours similar for you or have, were they kind of? Yeah. Similar? Yeah. Hours were similar. It's nine to five. Um, yeah. The culture, the culture is a little, it's very communal, I would say. Um, you know, everybody knew each other on the team. We all would have lunch together. And from my experience working in the US, at least it's a little bit of like every man for themselves kind of thing. Like there's not a huge kind of communal bond, I would say in corporate. I mean, I haven't had tremendous corporate experience in the US, so I can't um, you know, say that firmly, but from the experience that I've had, it's um, you know, been a, a lot less, a, a lot more individual. Um, and I, I would say that part of the world is a lot more community centered. Yeah. Great. Super interesting. Well, thank you yeah. for being here. Do, do students, do you have any questions for Zeke? It's a quiet class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, Kayla, was that you? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Actually, my camera's turning on. Um, so, like, you kind of talked about how, like, communal, like, the space is. Um, mm -hmm. For someone who is thinking about trying to go into more of, like, the Asian market, like, are there any, um, like, business customs that we should be aware of? Um, like, you know, kind of, like, social customs, but, like, anything as far as, like, I know some people, like, we don't talk about business outside of business or anything mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say, you know, at least from the experience and kind of the observation that I had, because I wasn't working in like the executive level, like making deals with brands or brand representatives, but um, it's definitely, it's definitely about building personal relationships. And, um, you know, in Vietnam, at least you would like, you would go out for maybe like, drinks at lunch or you would go out for like tea after work and building a very kind of personal relationship and it is business in a sense but um at least in that market there was definitely you had to kind of foster a more personal relationship with stakeholders in the business um so that would be my main piece of advice. I can't speak to the Asian market in general. I think, you know, Americans have a lot like to use like sweeping terminology when we refer to the Asian market, but it's very, very fragmented. Um, and every country is different, obviously, because every culture and every region has its unique cultures and um, traditions. But in the Vietnamese market, at least, which is, a, you know, if you're thinking about going into an Asian economy or an Asian emerging market, you know, Vietnam has like the fifth fastest growing GDP, like five years running now. Like there, yeah. there's a lot of, there's a lot of movement and growth in that region. Um, but it does come down to building, you know, per beyond work, personal trusted relationships, because that's what, that's what it's about. Okay, thank you. I bet you actually kind of led into my second question um, that was, like you said, you kind of only have like experience uh, in the Vietnamese market, but have you noticed like in like spending habits or anything from like each region, how it varies? 
In Asia or like globally? Uh, yeah, like in Asia specifically, just like in the different regions, like China compared to Vietnam, compared to like South Korea, have you noticed any like change or like? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, I, I traveled a lot in Asia while I was there. I lived there for nine years and I traveled to a majority of the countries in the Asian continent. Um, not to say that it was like in a business capacity because most of the time it was just leisure. But um, my observation is, in, you know, the Chinese market is very well established at this point, And the, a lot of um, European or American businesses have a pretty good understanding of if they want to enter those markets, how to enter those markets. But smaller emerging economies like Vietnam, um, the money is newer money. Um, so with that comes, um, a little bit more like conspicuous consumption, I would say, cause like, it's a lot of money that arrived to this very small group of people really fast and they're ready to spend it. And not to say that that's not the case in like a, you know, um, a superpower like China, cause it certainly is. But, um, you know, when you were talking about luxury brands, at least like, it, all you need is like a handful of clients who, you know, have, you know, millions, if not billions of dollars, and they can grow your business in the region like that, you know, like, it's, I think that would be the main difference. And there's 90 million people in Vietnam, and there's over a billion in China. So also, you have, you know, a difference in terms of population densities, too. Right. Thank you so much. I don't know if that answered your question, but I tried to. Sorry. Thank you for the question. <laughs> um, Jack, did you have a question? No, thank you so much. Well, uh, first off, uh, Caleb, I love your nails. And uh, I see you talking <laughs> with your pants today. Yeah, I see that. But, um, and, <laughs> and uh, Z, let's say, uh, last year, I remember reading in BOF report that uh, a lot of Eastern Asian countries is like you said, like you kind of, I think you kind of parsed against question is like one of the fastest growing like markets right now for luxury goods. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if since COVID you've seen a dramatic change since that, like they've released that report or what kind of like, what is your projection like for the next five years in like kind of that area for the market? Yeah. Um, well, I am in New York now. I haven't, I'm, I'm not in Vietnam. So I, don't have firsthand insight into that. I haven't been back since last Christmas when we were traveling. Um, but, you know, Vietnam got COVID under control within months. You know, they shut off their borders. They had like five deaths. Um, I think they've had a few more since then, but, you know, they handled it really well. So within the, the borders of the country, it was kind of normal, you know, like people were traveling you could go out, you wore a mask, but it, there wasn't such a fear of the virus as there is here. Um, but a lot of money in Vietnam comes from tourism. So, you know, despite the fact that they got COVID under control, there's still, you know, the economies, economies are so interconnected at this point that even if they're fine, like, you know, they don't have money coming into the country from tourism. So I think it's certainly been impacted that way. I don't know what what the future will look like for fashion or for luxury in Vietnam. Um, you know, those the Vietnamese um, population that can't afford luxury brands are, you know, probably still shopping luxury brands because they can go to stores and they can go out and they can, you know, do all those things. Um, so I think in kind of a vacuum, it still exists and the economy is still operating, but it's, you know, it's not, they're not, the income from tourism, which is a huge source of income for Vietnam, is not there. So I think that's had significant impact on the economy too. Yeah, that's a good, that's a great call out. We, um, we will have Kate answering some live questions about Nike's business, and I think maybe she'd be able to speak a little bit more clearly on what's happening in Asia right, right now. So Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Zeke. Um, Hawa, Thank do you, you want to see your, your, your question for Kate? And I see you have your hand up, but I don't know if it was specific for Zeke. Sure. Or you wanted no to problem. I'll wait. No okay. problem. Okay. Thank you. Great, because I, I want to make sure I get to Joyce. Zeke, thank you so much for joining us. Um, yes, Joyce, I also have 
have you in here today, another cultural fellow from Asia. And if, I don't know if you want to start off by telling us a little bit about your where you've worked and your experience. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Joyce. Um, like Vicky, I'm also a cultural fellow. Um, a little bit about myself. I am half Indonesian and half Japanese. Um, but most of my life, I grew up in Indonesia. Um, but most of my childhood from, you know, kindergarten through primary school, I was in a Japanese school based in Jakarta. So I have a bit of both cultures very ingrained into me. But in terms of work experience, I have um, a few work experiences from Jakarta and Indonesia in cosmetics and in fashion. Um, and I also have experience in working in advertising in Singapore and then another advertising agency in New York. That's great. Um, so I guess my same question would be for you, just if you could talk to us about the different personalities of the cities you've worked in. Yeah, um, I would say, uh, as Ziki mentioned before, um, Asia is very, in Asia, people are very, um, very together. Um, you know, it's not very individualistic like okay. how it is in New York. Um, as he mentioned, like every lunchtime, people go out together and we'll almost kind of like wait for the lunch hour to like start. Where else in like New York, I remember when it was like my first week um, when I started, everyone was like, going at lunch at like really different hours like either at 12 30 or like 2 30 like 3 I'm like what like do you guys even like go and eat sometimes they would just grab food and sit on the table and get back to work so it's a really different culture um between New York and uh, and in Asia but I can speak a little bit more about my experience in working in the body shop it's a cosmetics brand from the UK so I worked in the Jakarta franchise, uh, the Indonesia franchise, which uh, the head office was based in Jakarta. I was working in their marketing team, and I was put on this project for their product, their one of their best-selling products, uh, the tea tree oil, uh, which is like you know for various products um, and care for you know either acne treatment or just uh, moisturizing and all these kinds of ranges and so the target market was really uh, focusing on the youth so it was perfect because at the time I was graduating high school so I really could understand that this was my target market so my project was I pitched an idea to uh, create like an event uh, participating in an event similar to kind of like Coachella but we had our own version in Jakarta called Visa Fest so WTF mm -hmm. um, so I proposed the idea to start this camp this tea tree campaign um, while this product kind of is launching their new range um, at the festival and have a booth and you know do all these uh, different free events and social media um campaigns where you you know you come in and you can get your free like face uh, makeover with the makeup and then have a test trial of the products and then you know if you post it on social media then you get it for free and all these things so that was my main project while i was there at the body shop yeah awesome that sounds really interesting <laughs> was it a success yeah, it was a success. It was so much fun as well. It didn't even feel like I was working. I initially wanted to go to that festival on my own with my friends, but I eventually sold my ticket because I had to go there for work anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Win -win. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So right now I'm actually um, interning with them again, but this time I'm focusing on the e-commerce uh, analytics department. So I'm working as an analytics intern. So I'm uh, looking into their data, um, their e-commerce data, and finding all these consumer insights. For instance, we're currently looking at um, our performance and traffic in our blogs. So we noticed that almost 80% of our traffic is coming in from our blogs um, that are you know, tagged as lifestyle content, beauty content, and whatnot but we're seeing a high dropout rate. Um, and so my um, project is to really investigate what's going on in that and what can we do to um, enhance and create more engagement and to also look deeper into um, the 
buyer journey. So looking at um, how long it takes for a customer or a user to convert. And the reason why I wanted to go into data analytics is because I had some experience um, last year in the spring taking a statistics class at FIT. Um, and I learned a lot about data analytics and machine learning. And from then, I actually participated in a competition by Adobe Analytics. And our client was actually Nike. So it was a global uh, competition. And we were judged by a, pan um, a few uh, executives from Nike and other uh, major um, advertising directors and, and so on. And so our goal was to kind of look into the Nike web data, uh, their website and their mobile app, and really find a specific problem and show them how we can solve it using the data they provided. Okay. And so, yeah, thankfully, we won third place on that competition, awesome. which was a good That's experience great. for me. Great job. <laughs> cool. Well, this was great having you on. Does anyone have any specific questions for Joyce? Well, thank you for coming. And um, maybe if any questions brew up or students have more specific questions, um, if, if it's okay. I don't know if Zeke already left, but if it's okay for me to put them in contact with you guys, that would be awesome. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you so much. You guys have a good class. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, I'm going to switch gears now to my video with Kate. Hopefully you guys can see this OK. Everything. You can see everything? <laughs> yes. OK, I'm just going to press play. Hopefully this sounds OK. Um, if if there's an issue as it starts to move, if someone could just shout out or chat, that would be great. Oh, I'm sorry, you guys. I also I didn't um, I didn't read her bio to you guys yet. So let me let me kick off with that so that you're aware of her background. Um, I know I emailed it out to you guys, but. Okay, so Kate has worked within merchandising for 18 years across multiple American brands, including Ralph Lauren, J. Crew, Walmart, and now Nike. Focused on being in retail and wholesale, as well as developing product. Kate worked in New York City for 13 years and then moved to Portland, Oregon for Nike back in 2016. After spending three years working for the North American business at Nike, she was offered a role in Shanghai, China, leading the merchandising teams for all of Greater China, inclusive of digital stores and wholesale. The Chinese consumer is the future of how we interact in retail and leading the digital marketplace. With everything connected to your phone, ranging from super apps, daily transactions, and social, it is truly changing the way retail will look in the future. Kate led the team through the first marketplace affected with COVID-19 and helped bring growth for the year, utilizing the digital dominance while stores were being closed. She's also leading the team through the first connected marketplace across retail and wholesale and furthering how the future of Nike will look with putting the consumer at the core. With Kate, what Kate is most passionate about is leading a team through change, coaching the future generations of merchants, and being a mentor to future females, female leaders in the industry. So now I will press play on her video, and she will be joining us at about 5.30. Is there audio? Um, you know, there is. I think the problem is probably that I have my headphones on, so I'm going to take them off and then let me know if you hear. Okay. No problem. No problem. Let's How's see. That? So my career path has kind of been <laughs> somewhat, uh, cons you know, cons it went away again. But I would say How's what that? is unique is that. Um, I've worked okay. for multiple different brands and companies oh, of wow. different sizes. And I think in that comes different consumers, right? So you're following different paths and understanding different people. Um, but I've always stayed just 
curious and kind of what is the next in my head. I don't know if it's the right thing to do, but I've always wanted to understand more that that would help me in the future. And when I say that, it's you know why I'm in China now is that I was curious on kind of the biggest market that that um, from a growth perspective. And you know the Chinese consumer operates so differently than the American consumer. And I had been working in a North America market, even when I was working for global companies, still really only understanding the North American um, consumer, which is so vastly different um, to China. So you know I think I've really just stayed on a path, but I've had different interests throughout. Um, I don't know if that helps kind of the career path, but that was kind of my my guiding light on, you know, what what takes me to the next uh, next experience and next um, you know company or, or brand or whatnot. Yeah, that's great. Where um, how did you get that first job out of college? Uh, so again, not I mean. I don't think anyone really knows what they want to do when they graduate college. I know there's a few uh, that are, and that's awesome. I would say I didn't really know. I studied psychology, and um, which was actually super beneficial for my time in retail, uh, study of people. I definitely used it, um, but I, I didn't know. And so I, I moved to New York and, and applied for fashion companies and because I was interested in fashion. It was always kind of a passion of mine. And then marketing. I thought that the, the marketing world was intriguing. And I landed in a small, like, mom and pop uh, um, brand called uh, Buyer California. And they were based out of, based out of uh, San Francisco. And, um, you know, I, I just hit up every recruiter and but ended up landing a job there and uh, knew Pretty quickly, uh, it was a sales, a, sale, a small sales um, office, and any time the first market that we had, we you know sold to all the big department stores at the time. It was still separated, May Company and Federated, but um, you know Sears, Macy's, uh, Kohl's, kind of all the the big names. And when the buyers would come in, I, I wanted to do what they were doing. I wanted to pick what was going to be in the stores and um, I didn't want to be on the sales side on the, on the, uh, you know, selling our, our product. And so I, I kind of learned pretty quickly and the brands that I wanted to work for. Um, and that was kind of how I, my first, uh, you know, findings of retail and what I was interested in and what I was, you know, passionate about and good at. Um, so that kind of just took me on a path of uh, creating a list of brands that I wanted to work for. And, um, you know, there was just a list of five and I've worked for three out of those five. So I, yeah, um, you know, I, I would say I'm, you got to, as a New Yorker, as you know, you got to be a hustler, right? And so I, I took people out, I, I networked and took people out for coffees and drinks to try to get into, um, the brands that I wanted to work for and ended up landing um, first at Ralph Lauren, my first stint at Ralph Lauren. And then uh, from there, you know, went to J. Crew. Walmart was kind of after J. Crew was Walmart, and that was a little bit out of the norm, but that was, again, in that point of time in my career, I was interested in working for the biggest retailer and understanding how they operate and, um, so yeah, so that and then and then back to Ralph Lauren and then and Nike. So um, yeah, I would say getting a job out of college is you know it's not easy, but it's doable, and you have to almost just jump in, find something that you're interested in, jump in, and then figure it out as you go, and be open to kind of following different paths, if, even if that's not exactly where you landed, and, and you know. If the role that you landed in isn't exactly what you envisioned or pictured, just be open to other things so that you can follow other paths. Because um, I certainly never wanted to be in sales, and there's nothing wrong with sales. Yeah. Um, but for me, it wasn't what I wanted to do. But I took a sales job to get into the fashion industry, and then 
it kind of yeah. led me more to the yeah exactly yeah. that's great um so you've always you've always sort of been in that since the sales role in the buying yes. and into merchandising role can you can you tell us what it is to be a merchandiser you know kind of a week in the life of you know pre-covid what that looks like for you uh, yeah i i would say um so merchandising and when i started in in merchandising or you know other companies also say buyers right it's kind of and a buyer is a true like you're you're writing the orders and um but ultimately buyers and merchants do the same thing they are kind of the in my opinion the glue <laughs> kind of keeps everyone kind of working and operating and, and when i say that it's because you you have the most um, touch points if you're working with the sales team, if you're working with design, if you're working with production, you're working with, um, uh, you know, account teams. Like there's so much that a merchant needs to understand and do. Um, and that is really the art of combining science, science and art, right? Uh, the, the merchant is responsible for understanding the consumer, seeing opportunities, um, but also being able to take the vision of designers and um, where brands kind of want to take the consumer, but but since the merchant understands where they are, like it's that it's that making sure we're protecting the business, but also taking the consumer somewhere new, but not entirely new where we lose the consumer. So you know, you those you have to have a passion for product. You have to have a passion for for um, consumers and and how they interact with you how they want to see you as a brand um so i you know i would say merchants are are extremely important in the whole ecosystem of retail i know i'm partial um but it you know and, and i've seen it change and shift throughout the years and i would say that it's merchandising is in a unique position now um because we are in a digital world and um you know there's there's some out there that feel that what we do can be done through data and through um kind of automation but you know i obviously feel very different uh but i do think it's something to stay on top of and make sure that the trade of being a merchant and a buyer um is something that that stays within because we're we are that uh, balance and the not every data point or, or computer can, they don't have a gut, right? Whereas merchants right. have guts and they are the ones that can say, hey, this trend is going to be big, let's invest in this and take those risks. Um, that's how companies kind of get to other, um, I don't know, other points in their, in their journey. Um, I feel strongly about that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I always think that the buyer slash merchant role is kind of 50% art, 50% science. Yep. There is a lot of history and analytical thought process that goes into making a buy, but there is a lot of it that is creativity and knowing how to put things together and knowing how, you know, observing what's out there in the world and, and, yep. and adapting that and making that a sure thing for a trend so exactly exactly I, I agree with you i don't think it could be computerized can't be bottled yes. <laughs> yes. Um, tell us about your current role you know how did you as i mentioned before you're in shanghai so I mean, yes. how did you find yourself there yeah so i um started working at nike about five years ago now which is crazy to how fast time flies but um i spent the first three years at nike um in portland oregon working for north america the you know geo there um and i was approached about a job uh in china in shanghai china and and, and you know most big corporations they have you know the um we call it CFEs, so it's it's your basically your your performance rating, and in that you have an IDP, which is your like kind of where you want to go. And I've always written on that I would I would do a stint international. I've always wanted to, um, even my time back at Ralph Lauren, I was always looking to to live and work internationally. I thought that that would be a great life experience, but then also um, a 
a great tool for my belt as I go on, you know, in my career. And, you know, I would say most people and within the Nike community, um, they're all, they're a lot are from Oregon, like they're born and bred Oregonians. And so me saying I wanted to move to Shanghai, China was like so foreign, right? But Shanghai is, a, you know, a huge international city. Um, and again, what I had referenced earlier is that China is just the growth of really the world and kind of all the focus currently right now for all brands, everyone wants a piece of China. And I wanted to better understand um, how that consumer works. So I, when they offered me the job, I actually accepted without even going to Shanghai. I was so excited. And they're like, why don't you visit Shanghai first, Kate, and then, you know, and then see if it's yeah. yeah. And how long um, have you been at that point? Three years. Okay. Three years. Yeah. So um, I actually, the day I left for uh, China was my third, my, like, anniversary of being at Nike for three yeah. years. So, yeah. Um, so I, not only did I accept the job because of, um, just the opportunity, but it was also allowing me to, um, from a career standpoint, I, you know, had a broad scope. I was managing all of, all of mar mar the merchandising for the marketplace in China. So all of our stores are factory stores as well as digital. Um, so it kind of was a no brainer for me to just take a leap of faith and, and see where Nike could take me. And I, it's been amazing. It's been such an amazing experience. Um, yeah, but I, you know, I would say that I think the biggest learnings for me so far are just, it's a digital marketplace. Um, and we in, in you know the U.S. have so much to learn, <laughs> and you know they they operate here at such a speed that you know trends become obsolete in like 24 hours, right? I mean that's an exaggeration, but but it feels that way at times, right? So you really have to stay on top of everything, and how you interact with the consumer is so different than. Um, than in North America, we're still very much reliant on on our web, right, on our web pages and computers. Whereas in China, everyone is on their phone. So if you think about the accessibility at any given day, I mean, if they're always on their phone, you're always communicating, talking, they're shopping, they're using their phone for their daily lives, which in the U.S. we use our phones, but we don't have the app structure that they have. We don't, you know, they have. Um, WeChat basically operates as this super app for for Instagram, Facebook, Venmo. I mean, it, everything is within that one chat. You've got many programs. So we at Nike, we have a mini program that is embedded into WeChat. So you can, you know, we found that they don't do a lot of shopping on WeChat, but it's a good gateway for us to get them into our app or into our stores, really, right? Um, so it's... It's just incredible what they do on their phones and how they interact. Um, I mean, it's I don't carry around a wallet in China. I just have my phone. Your your phone is everything. So, um, you know, QR codes. It's it's been fascinating to watch the U.S. with COVID. Now QR codes have become a thing. Whereas before, you know, even me moving to China, I was like, what's all this? You're constantly scanning QR codes. That's how you pay for pretty much everything. There is a, a small uh, kind of grocery store, I would say, I mean, it's, it's really just like a stall on the street in, in the area where I live, which is a French concession, and um, they're, they've, it's more geared towards expats or foreigners, and they have named her the Avocado Lady. Because way like decades ago, she was able to get avocados for her, the, you know the Westerners, and but now she's turned into this kind of destination where people can go and and, and get things, and and she's a stall, right? So there's and her business. I mean, she you just she scans your QR code and that's how you pay her. Um, like even the smallest of, I was in um, over the holidays. A, 
few friends and I, we went to uh, Lijiang, which is Western China and near the Tibetan like mountain region. And there was a woman on the side of the road that was allowing people to take pictures with her goats and she had a QR code. <laughs> so that was how you paid her. So everything is um, digitalized and, and, and it, it kind of allows people to quickly kind of get up and running in a business and, and um, uh, yeah, anyways, that's why I'm like, everyone invests in Bitcoin. It's something, I see it here. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's super interesting too, because you were, you were telling me before about COVID restrictions and you actually check in with your QR code. Yep, exactly. Yeah, no, they, they, everything is tracked on your phone as well. So um, before you enter into any restaurant or, or um, museum or, you know, any type of, place where there's a big crowd you have to show your QR code and have your temperature taken and if your QR code isn't green then then not, you know you'll have to be tested or you know you got to go back home um, but that's basically they just track all of the hot spots throughout and that's how they know that you've been in one of the hot spots is through your QR code so yeah it's, it's fascinating it's it's um, but it makes it really easy to live here uh, um, by how much uh, kind of reliance is on on digital and your phone, and um, it, you can order groceries in like an hour here, and everything is is so accessible. Um, it's a, definitely convenience. Convenience is a big thing in in China. I mean, we we laugh because Amazon is Amazon Prime. Their basis of their business or their you know is you know, next day delivery or one day delivery. And like yeah. for the Chinese consumer that you can't offer that. Like their they their expectation is that the delivery is there in an hour. You know, like they're so that's not a, a pull for the Chinese consumer. Um, just because of how the infrastructure, especially in big cities, has been built. Um, and the delivery service and the convenience. It's just it's un it's uncomparable to, to the US. Wow. Crazy. Well, yeah. so I guess as far as personalities of cities that you worked in, you worked in New York, Portland, and Shanghai. Yeah. Did you work in San Francisco as well? No, just just New York okay. and okay. yeah. So, can you tell us a little bit about your perspective on the differences between between the three? Yeah, you know, I would say I think the biggest culture shock was moving to Portland, Oregon, from New York. I think that was that was a tough one for me. Um, I, I would say that Shanghai and New York are very similar. Um, obviously, I mean, Shanghai is a 24 million uh, person city, and so the the it's much larger on scale, but it has similar energy and um, diversity and culture, and um, you know, there's I think. I think Portland was just a tough, it's a, it's a small town. It's, it's, you know, not a, not a city. Um, so I think, but you know, there's great people that move there for Nike. So you definitely get a really interesting, uh, crew of people. Um, but you know, again, you feel the hustle in Shanghai, which was always what I loved about New York and New Yorkers is that you, you there's so much energy and just, you know, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere, right? That's the saying, and I, I, I feel that in Shanghai. Um, it's still such a growing city, and um, you know, growing by the day, and it's going to become like a powerhouse, like New York. I, I can see in a very, very short time. Yeah. Um, but it, but it's it's I like. There's no place like New York. I know I'm, I'm a New Yorker. I can say that. I've lived there for 13 years. Um, but, uh, uh, and I'm from New York State, but, um, you know, Shanghai definitely has, it's, it's gaining speed. And like, you know, in terms of attracting, you know, Generation Y and like there are a lot of young people that want to live in a big city and um, be a part of kind of the growth of really the future. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Need to hear about. That. <laughs> um, so tell us about the last year. You were you were just telling me a little bit about it, but tell about it, tell us about it from um, from a work 
family perspective, and you know how nice totally. it this year. Totally. Um, yeah, so a, a, a year ago, uh, the first few cases um, were reported in Wuhan, and I think at the time we we had we didn't have any full retail stores, but we have a, quite a bit of um, partner stores as well as um, our factory stores in Wuhan. So those were the first doors to close, and I think that was when you know no one can really prepare. Uh, for something like this. I don't think anyone in our generation has gone through a, a global pandemic, right, um, at this scale, right, because we are so connected um, just yeah. by <laughs> airplanes, everything, like, you know, everything. We, we are truly a world economy. So I think we didn't really know what was going to happen, but what we started to understand and do, um, you know, the government, uh, which is different than the U.S. government, is that that they they can mandate right and they can shut shut cities down. And so when they closed down Wuhan, I think that was the first signal that we thought, okay, this may turn into something bigger. And so what are we going to do as a as a company as a brand? And I think the first few things that we talked about um because we were on daily calls um trying to kind of assess the situation uh we were getting notifications from the government on kind of their strategy um around cities and uh mandating you know people to stay home as well as um small group gatherings all of that so as a brand we have we had to think through first obviously the business most importantly, I would say before the business is our the health of our that we call them athletes, right? So people on the front line that are in our stores working with consumers. So how do we keep them healthy? But as well as how are we going to, you know, still produce the numbers that we're we're, we're kind of gold to for for the brand and for the company? Because um, we had some pretty we had we have some pretty high targets um, in, in greater China. So what we ultimately ended up deciding and doing is the government was allowing um, our distribution centers to stay open, certain distribution centers. And so we've got, because it's such a digital marketplace and our, our digital penetration is the highest in, in the whole entire company, most, most uh, digital is around 20% to other geos in that US. Europe and um, we call it APAC, um, but China is upwards around 40 and we're growing. So we have distribution centers that are, are smaller, they're called CLCs, and so we, um, we can get to the consumers faster, right? And we also use them for our factory stores and so they're multifunctional, but it's, it's just, they're kind of little, little distribution centers all throughout the country where, um, it creates more mobility for us. So when we continued to get um, store closures and we had, um, you know, obviously a ton of cancellations from our, our partner doors, our wholesale doors, um, we ended up just shifting everything to digital. So I think at one point my team and I, we were managing like, I think it was like 9 million units of just goods that we need to get through because of cancellations, door closures. Uh, we were taking an in inventory from our own factory stores, um, just trying to mitigate the risk. We also were finding, um, you know, we have a large uh, amount of business that is dedicated to our high heat. So at Nike, you know, the sneaker, the sneaker head and the, the um, you know, we, there's a whole supply and demand model that that's a whole other story, but we were finding that um, we still would have in the doors that we were op that were opened because our main flagship store um, it's called House of Innovation. They have one in New York, uh, in Shanghai, stayed open actually the whole time. The government allowed uh, that door to stay open with restrictions. Certain people, only a certain amount of people in, but. Um, Again, we did not, we could not foresee this, but we forgot, you know, because life is happening and everything, we're trying to mitigate things and there's so much craziness. And um, 
we would have we had this one high heat launch that dropped in house of innovation and it caused uh you know a, a crowd and so we kind of got slapped on the hand and so then you know my team that manages the launch business uh we have we had to go through everything for the next two months um, to understand. And the merchant, again, this this is where the merchant matters, is screen out all of the high heat because we have to figure out the ecosystem, right? We can't just yeah. take everything to digital. Like there's still store plans that we need to hit and there's still, and so what we did as merchants is what the team did is they, they went through and just gut checked, okay, is this going to draw a crowd? Is this not going to draw a crowd? And anything that they felt like, draw a crowd they just shifted to our our sneakers app um where you know, the digital so that to me was just fascinating because you you you're really i mean talking about um kind of putting out fire drills on a daily weekly basis throughout when we were going through and, and really no one else in our like all of our counterparts and other geos were not going through it right and little did they know that we were kind of little did we know I should say that we were writing the playbook that then Nike used um, when they started to go through all of their uh, spikes and COVID cases so um, I guess myself included I we had no idea what, what we were doing to be completely honest uh, but I think it, it's just kind of problem solving at its at its best um and and we ended up growing by double digits for the year uh we were able to, yeah and it was really just about shifting everything to digital um keeping our our athletes safe uh and and then from a branding standpoint i know we talked about this briefly we really were able to come in at a time where um everyone is stuck in their homes. So we had to find a way to reach them. And we had live streams. We were the first uh, brand to do live streams for, which live streams are a big thing here, but that's, an, that's also another, um, but through our app, so they could actually access workouts. Um, and now that's a thing, right, in the US, but that wasn't being, that wasn't being done. All the apps, even in the US prior to COVID were, um, subscriptions and memberships but you would go in and access taped recordings it wouldn't be live yeah. so um you know nike as a brand here were the government i guess it was a few years back now has declared sport as as they met they you know the organization needs to do oh, sorry brothers he has impeccable timing that happened to me another day. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, my brother in Bali. Um, so uh, the government has uh, declared that sport matters because what they're finding is um, as it's a growing economy uh, and it's becoming more westernized, with that comes more western uh, diseases, right? Heart disease and, and also food, right? So the kids are... Um, gaining more weight so they're they're now enforcing in the school systems you know an hour or two of sport a day and you know running uh is such a big sport throughout the world but it's just gaining speed in, in china like right so so if you are in a, the sport market in china is a huge opportunity to to lead um lead the Chinese consumer into being healthy and fitness and, 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 and sport. So I think that was a huge um, pivot for us as a brand as how we reach the consumers differently and how we're continuously getting them to, to move and be active. Um, and that kind of helped us uh, really continue to be, we're you know still the number one sports brand in, in China by far. Um, uh, because we've got such a, um, you know, our DNA is, is to get people moving and, and our, we've got really great brand team that kind of marketing, <laughs> brand marketing, uh, team that, that helps enforce that. Um, awesome. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if you can share specifically, but 
you, if you had double digit growth, did you actually end up hitting your plans that you had for the year or were you just planned? So, wow. No, we that's did amazing. our plans. Yeah. You were the only so, person I talked to all year. <laughs> I know. Awesome. I know. Yeah. And I, you know, again, we, in China, we could do that because the infrastructure is there. You know, yeah. I think in the U.S. it's harder because the delivery service is just not, I mean, we we have our own delivery service, but we were also outsourcing. So there's the, these smaller delivery services that can can really kind of get to places quite quickly. Um, so you know, we we didn't kind of miss a beat in terms of uh, we may have been delayed a little bit based on where you lived, but for the most part, um, we were also offering like they can go and you know pick up in store and bring. You know, there was there was just. We had the infrastructure uh, to, to kind of operate through a, a, a pandemic, um, yeah. which, is, which helped. We're really yeah. beneficial. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so you you mentioned to me over email that you had had issues with bot mitigation. Yeah. I don't know if that sounds like that's something a little bit more specific as well to Asia. Can you talk to us about this issue and? Yeah, so um, really uh, bots are kind of everywhere, right, throughout throughout the world because bots are just resellers. And we need we need resellers in our ecosystem. It's kind of it's what they, they help us. They help make us cool. They help create the demand. Um, but we don't want too many of them, right? We can't have them be, they, we can't have them getting all of the inventory so that our, our true consumer, our true sneakerhead doesn't, um, because there's a certain level of uh, frustration when when people can't win um, certain draws or or things that you know they line up and they can't they can't you know because there's also not only is there uh, an electronic bot there's also a, a human bot in China where uh, resellers pay um, kind of the little aunties and uh, to stand in line. Uh, to, to get these, these big purchases. But I think what the the immense amount of work that we've done as a brand, and it's not me, right, the technical uh, team on, on mitigating is, is really just about how how many entries, because there's any given drop, I would say, depending on the style, um, any big collab with, you know, off-white, like that, that can sell out within seconds on our, in our digital. But, what the team has been able to do is understand like clean, they're called clean ballot funded entries. So meaning like what they're trying to get through on like what's a bot and then what's the actual real human. Wow. But the, I mean, there's millions, right? So there's, and, and we look at demand served. So basically um, based on how many clean entries there are um, of those clean entries, how many, people did we serve, which in China were typically around like 2%, which is not good. You don't want to piss people off that much. Um, but, you know, we're trying to find other ways. The consumer is really great. They're, they're, they're giving us ideas on how to, because they're just as frustrated. Um, but but it's we're, we're on the brink of really, I mean, facial recognition is a big one. You know, obviously bots don't have faces. So, like, how are we incorporating that into our, our system to ensure that it's a true person? Um, but, again, it's that balance because resellers, no one wants to have anything go to resellers, but they are part of our, our ecosystem. So it's, it's really trying to figure out that balance. I mean, I never worked in the supply-demand model until I came to Nike because, I mean, at Ralph Lauren, as you know, we were trying to sell everything that we could. There was no holding back inventory, <laughs> whereas that is part of the the business is is making sure that you're not putting out as much supply as there is demand, so you keep shoes hot and you keep the consumers kind of coming back, and it's a halo effect to the rest of the rest of the business. Um, yeah that like kind of visionary sneaker obsessed we call them consumers they're they're at the very top um so we definitely want them to we we want that pull uh so that it's just been a fascinating business model to be a part of and learn and um kind of grow too 
you know, the team and I, we spend a lot of time on that, that halo. What's that connection? And if there's a, I mean, Dunk is the big one now. Um, I sound like probably your students are probably like, oh, she's such a, a loser because I, I'm not a sneakerhead. I've never, will never say I'm a sneakerhead. Um, but, the, you know, Dunk is the big one of Nike right now that we've got such, such large demand. And, you know, we've got a certain amount of inline that aren't part of the, the launch collection that are just also operating as a launch style. We had, you know, huge crowds. I mean, this is just like black and white, like very basic styles that are, you know, again, it's just understanding how, how hot the trend is and trying to figure out how to manage it. Um, and that's really what Kind of, do you guys collaborate that globally, or is it each market is a little bit different? Yeah, no, so it starts in the globe, right? So the global team it kind of um, decides and distributes uh, the allocations throughout the, the geos, and yeah. it's a partnership on working with them and, and making sure that they understand how much demand we have. Um, yeah. uh, no. So, yeah, it, it starts central, and then it, and then it gets up but it's crazy it's definitely uh, that's been very fascinating working you know yeah learning learning that um, and then watching the resale value and but I, I would say the biggest opportunity we have is women right and, and and her and how we're how we're creating her launch I will always remember there was, I was in a meeting uh, I guess a while ago now and um, you know, the, the, the launch crew is definitely the cool guys on campus, right? And they were they were showcasing a Swarovski crystal um, Air Max. And they were saying, like, oh, and we think it can retail at this. And I was like, and it's for her? I was like, you do know that she spends, like, $600 on pumps. Like, I think she could probably spend a little more than, you know, there's just there's just so much opportunity for, for her at Nike. Um, yeah. Apparel footwear uh, within the launch business, within just day to day, you know, sport, fitness, yoga. There, there's just so much that Nike can um, tap into. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. So one of my one of my hot button topics on this year, uh, yeah. on top of you know where in the world can you work in retail, is mm-hmm. um, sustainable uh, mission. And just wondering what Nike is doing to that end, because I know it. I know everyone's yeah, doing. So, yes, they're doing a tremendous um, within footwear and apparel. Um, it is one of our, you know, main missions and goals. Uh, we did a huge launch for well, this past Olympics that got um, Japan. It was called uh, Spacey. So essentially, they're figuring out how to make we can't make every shoe sustainable but the majority of our shoes to a certain extent have sustainable materials as well as our our apparel i don't think i think nike can do a better job communicating because we do most of our apparel is sustainable to a certain extent i mean obviously we can't it's not 100 percent um but they're working towards that there's a whole team at nike dedicated to sustainability uh it's one of our companies um main kind of priorities for the foreseeable future yeah. so yeah it's a it's a huge opportunity i think i think how we communicate to consumers is still something that we need to figure out because um it matters especially it matters to gen y like uh there's been so many studies on across the globe that the young kids kind of growing up that this is something that is important to them uh so and it should be important to all of us, right? I mean, this is, yeah. we want to protect our, our our future. So, no, it's a main priority for Nike. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, how, where has your work brought you travel-wise? I mean, have you, I'm sure you've been around Asia quite a bit, but yes. any favorite locations or cool stories? Um, I mean, I... Yes, the first trip that I did with my team, uh, when I first landed in in China, we um, went to see stores, and um, so we went to uh, 
started in Xi'an, which is an amazing city. I mean, the funny thing is, is I, such a naive American, you know, I, I know like the big cities in China, right? Beijing, Shanghai. What I didn't realize is how big other cities are, right? I mean, they, we went to Chongqing and Chongqing is 31 million, right? And I had never heard of Chongqing before. And there's so many cities like that in, in China. So um, I would say Shanghai is definitely, you You have more of a European feel. You, you kind of are in a little bit of a bubble, but the second you go outside, there's so much culture and there's so much rich, richness. And um, I, that was, I still talk about it with my team. It was one of my favorite trips because we, you know, obviously did business. We visited stores and, and, and you know, kind of looked at opportunities, looked at, you know, our, our competitors, but we did a lot of cultural uh, events as well. Um, we went to a Chinese opera. We uh, went to see the Terracotta Warriors, which is amazing and crazy to think that they were just found in the 70s, right? Like this wasn't that long ago. Um, uh, we've done the Great Wall. We've done, um, we went and saw the pandas like uh, in Chengdu, which they're so effing cute. So yeah, I would say, you know, really China has been the first. I, I didn't get to kind of see the world in, in my other roles uh, because I was only working in North America. Uh, but in China, it's been, just, you get to see a lot of malls that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A lot of malls in the U.S. Yeah, yeah. which could be shifting. Um, okay. But yeah, I think I uh, it's been so fun. And then before the world kind of shut down, I was able to, you know, because of my proximity of, of so many other places, to see the world, you know, other countries, and it's been Great. quite the experience. Yeah. 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 How about the language barrier? Has that been a challenge for you at all? You know. Yes and no. I would say uh, when I traveled outside of Shanghai, I use my minimal Chinese more. I get kind of get away with things in Shanghai because pretty much everyone speaks English. And in the office, um, you know, because we're an American brand and every, everyone, everyone speaks English, which I actually find, I mean, it's the most humbling experience to walk into a room and everyone is speaking in Chinese and then quickly they, you know, see me and they switch to English. Like I, again, I just feel like such a stupid American where I couldn't imagine presenting or starting a conversation in one language and finishing it in another, right? The, the way that they can kind of bounce back and forth is just, it's, it, it's inspiring. I'm like, wow, I, I need to do better. But it, yeah. it hasn't. You are to learn a language, though, especially. Yes. Yeah. Like when you start, like, you know, when you start as an adult, it's not easy. Yeah. Um. And and Chinese is is difficult. Um. For 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 a lot of reasons. But then, you know, I was taking to classes and they were teaching me kind of by the book. And then I'd say something to my team and they laugh at me. They're like, "We don't say that." I was like, "Oh," <laughs> you know, just because of you know, the formality, there's, there's so many different levels of Chinese. Um, so now I'm, I, I kind of just latch on to what they're saying and hearing what they say so that I can learn kind of more of the day to day. And be, I just want to be able to communicate, um, at the bare minimum. I'm never going to be able to speak, uh, in a business sense, but, um, it, it has been, it's fun kind of now picking out words on the streets like oh i know what they're kind of saying you know that's been, that's yeah. been fun. yeah that's really cool so awesome. well um i think i'm gonna i'm gonna uh finish up with my questions so that we yes. leave time for class for students yeah on live on monday um but yes. what piece of advice do you have for students who are just getting out there and how they can make themselves more hireable yeah you know um I guess I'll, I'll go back to what I had said in the beginning on, you know, don't feel like you have to have it figured out. I would say, um, make sure you know what you're interested in, right? Make sure that you're clear on what your interests are so that when you get into a situation where you're maybe taking someone out for coffee on a brand that you want to work for or uh, setting up some sort of connection uh, with a mentor, you need to be able to articulate just the very beginning of what is what you're passionate about.
about or what you're excited about and what you're interested in. Um, because that will then allow who you're speaking to to help guide you. Because I, I would say the uh, majority of people are right out of college kids that I've mentored. That is, I think, the hardest. And it, it's not it's okay if you don't have the answers, right? You don't have to have, but you have to have interests. You have to have, you have to be curious. And, you know, as a merchant and kind of coaching future merchants, you have to stay curious and you have to ask questions. I would say that would be the first. The second would be, you know, get in, be open to where you're going to go. Don't, I think, um, give so much like value to the first company you work for because it's not your forever it could be for your, your forever you could you could have you could be super clear and like hey i want to work for nike and i'm like i got into nike i'm pumped i'm gonna stay at nike that could be you but for those that maybe don't have it figured out like just dip your feet in you got to start somewhere don't hold so much i mean it has to be directionally and where you want to go. I wouldn't say if you if you want to be in fashion and you're in law, like that, that may not add up, right? <laughs> well, yeah, we want to go. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but yeah, I think that would, that would be my, my second piece of advice. And um, I think third would, would just be, um, this is, they're the generation that are going to be our future. And so when you get in, don't be intimidated to not use your voice and share your thoughts. I think we, I value, because I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I feel like we're not old, but we are old, right? I'm, I'm, yeah. right. <laughs> I mean, coming up 20 years of almost 20 years of being in this industry and I don't know kind of I don't know it all right I, I and I we need the younger generations to keep us fresh and keep us relevant and keep us kind of moving in a direction where where um, we need to go as, as a as a brand and as a company and even as an individual so um, yeah I think I think those would be my three pieces of advice for kind of the next generation of and have fun i mean this is so exciting like you know um if i think back to my first few years on on in, in the real world you know it's fun it's exciting it's new and there's so much going on in, in every industry no matter what you're going into um yeah that's a great piece of advice. Not in this class, but I did have a student ask me that the other day. You know, if, if I'm an assistant buyer, does anyone does anyone want to hear? Will my buyer want to hear my opinion? And I was like, a good buyer will want to hear your yes. opinion 100, percent especially yes. if you are the target audience. Yes. Um, so exactly. you know, everyone's opinion is valid. Obviously, you shouldn't. You need to be respectful about how you give it, but yes, you should. You should feel comfortable to give it and especially in an right. interview to show that you have an opinion and that's absolutely and again that that it takes practice right show like you've got to find your voice right and understand when to when to um give your opinion and when to kind of hold back and that that takes practice but you got to just get in there yeah that's yes. great <laughs> well this was amazing thank you yeah. so much for taking time and and of making course. this weird um time change work for for both of us yes um, yes no thank you and i Great look to forward to judith's questions on monday yes um, hi guys hope you enjoyed the recording i see kate has joined us live are you there kate? yes hi thank hi. you so joining us so early in the oh morning. my gosh no it's no problem i do feel like i just woke up though so please excuse the face <laughs> great <laughs> well great students um do you just i'm sure there are lots of questions do you want to raise your hand and i'll call on you in order michaela let's start with you um so my question is well, so I know myself I work in retail and um ever since I got back from COVID there's like a lot of talk about my store and a couple other locations closing because the whole digital market has been so successful so my question is do you see the physical market having any use 
or any value in the future if digital continues to be successful? That's a great question. Yes, I do. I think there, um, I think retail is shifting, but it does not mean that we're walking away from stores. In fact, I think stores are becoming more important based on the fact of, you know, that is, uh, that's our, our, um, our touch and feel with the customer, right? With the consumer. That's really when our, our athletes, our store employees really get front and center with what, what is the feedback for consumers is. So that is not going away. I think it will shift. I think market, the marketplace from the store side will look different, but the retailers that will win are how they, it, how they use digital in their stores, right? That true Omni O to O experience. I think those will be kind of the, the forefront and, um, they're gonna they're gonna win on on how they're applying digital to stores, but stores are very much still very important. At Nike, it is, and I know from other retailers too. It's just a shift, but that's a good question. Definitely, and I know you guys are all starting to restate the Fashion 2021 um, by McKinsey, and I think that that's a topic that they cover a lot, and you should dive in there, Michaela. Um, Kathleen, you next. Hi, is there anything that surprised you about the pandemic affected market? Like something that you that you guys were like anticipating to happen because of COVID and then didn't or something that you're completely blindsided by? Um, wow, another great question. I think, um, you know, I think COVID in, in totality was a blindside, right? I don't think anyone was was really prepared. So I, so how it played out, I we, we we had no way of foreseeing how it would play out. Um, so I think, in essence, it was a surprise. But I, but I do feel that you know now that we've learned, we've been in kind of this this world for for a year now. I think now is when we're starting to really do true learnings on how you how you get through this type of global uh, situation. Because I think our first our first uh, attack, or at least um, what we applied was, you know, markdowns because we had an exorbitant amount of inventory to get through. But now that the marketplace, inclusive of China, US, really globally, it has been in this promotional markdown. I think now what we're doing is, hey, the consumers, that's not going to draw traffic into your stores or into um, on online. What we're now realizing is that this is our opportunity to really start to tell stories on all of our full price product, really bring in um, you know, more of our athletes, our, 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 our sport athletes, right, on how we're upholding them to kind of sell the message and, and the brand of Nike of, of being active. So I think now we're, which is, which I think in a year ago, we would we would say we're always going to be in kind of this markdown mentality to, to drive traffic, but we're seeing kind of the opposite of consumers now. They've the marketplace is saturated with with markdowns, and they might want full price product. Um, so I think that has been a, a good learning from us. But great question. Thank you. Um, Hawa, I have you next. Hi, nice meeting you. Um, I'm someone that sees myself actually moving to another country, maybe for a year or two. Um, what are some pros and like what are some pros or like disadvantages and advantages of moving and maybe establishing a brand out in a European or Asian country compared so, to sorry compared to making a made New York um, company? Yeah. Um, so did I hear you correctly? You're gonna you're moving to Asia. You're moving to China. No, hypothetically. Oh, hypothetically. Okay, got it. <laughs> I was like, that's amazing. Um, you know, I I think any any big city, any um, you know, New York is a great place in in tor in terms of exposing yourselves to all different cultures and all different. I mean, the U.S. in general. I mean, that's kind of how we were created, right? I think. You can use everything that you're learning on um, when you go into another culture is in New York, you kind of have a little taste of everything, right? I would say that um, 
from a culture shock standpoint, you are, when you move to Asia, it is different, right? You're, you're not around uh, the, the normal that you're used to, um, even when you have different cultures. You're, you're, you're going into a, a place where there's primarily one culture. And I think the more that you can just be open to that culture and understand that there's differences and not, not think of them as bad or good, just different. I think that would get you kind of up and running pretty quickly because because there are a lot of cultural differences and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just something that we're, you know, not used to in, in the U.S. Um, so yeah, being, being open to the cultural differences, but then also if you're moving to a big city, all big cities have the same vibe and energy as New York. So if you can make it in New York, you can kind of make it anywhere, is my opinion. Um, and especially in Shanghai, it's such a it's such an international city, and it's booming. Um, and I would say all of the big cities in China feel have that similar feel. We had um we had some cultural. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um. So when you want to start a brand in Asia, and which is easy because all the all the manufacturing does happen in China, obviously. But how yes. would someone go about it? Like, so that they'll save money? Because if I know if I start a brand out in New York and I get, you know, maybe I get a few tailors to make things for me, or I go to the factories in Mexico, how would it differ? And what steps yeah. would I take? I mean, I think um, I've never opened a business in either the US or China, but I would say, you know, really. If you're gonna do anything in China, you have to start on digital. That's actually how a lot of brands um, started here. In fact, Maya Active, which is you know one of our one of our competitors now um, in China, it's a, a women's um, kind of started off with Lululemon esque uh, in terms of um, really focusing in on the cult, on the the yoga consumer. They started on Tmall. They started online, and now they have storefronts. But um, really, kind of to get going in the marketplace in in Shanghai in, in China and reach a broad community is is digital. Um, I again, you know, there's there's a um, little red book which is kind of similar to um, um, oh my gosh, now the 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 Western ver uh, not Instagram, but um, Oh my goodness! Snapchat. No, what's the 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 post where like the oh my god? Um, not TikTok. Not TikTok. No, no, no. It's it's like the the where you can get style and recipes and Pinterest. Um, Pinterest. Yeah, Pinterest. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> I've clearly been in Asia for too long. So little red book. Um, you can uh, people start on little red book or on um. Uh, T Mall, the, the smaller format, because T Mall or Taobao is similar, you know, to like it's kind of like an Etsy and an Amazon. So you can have small vendors, um, and you can start up a shop on on Taobao or T Mall quite quite easily. So yeah, digital would be the way to go. And then I don't know how. To, I mean, factories. There's so many. I would say that's that's just about getting in and understanding the factories and understanding kind of what they they do and how they operate and um, that you there's a plethora of them here as you said they're it's right in our backyard especially for apparel. Thank you. Yeah. I'm smiling because my camera isn't working. You can't see me smiling, but I'm smiling. <laughs> Good. Okay. Um, Caleb. Hello. Thank you for coming. Hi. Um, yes. I have a question. Um, what has been the most difficult part of being a team leader during this um, like unprecedented time? Um, you know, that's a that's a really great question. I I would say. In the beginning, there's gone there. You know, there's different phases. Um, I think when it all was going, when it all was starting in, in Asia and China, um, you know, it was there was a lot of hysteria, right? Rightfully so. I think um, we had teammates, families that were being affected. You know, no one really knew what was happening. And I think for me, 
one thing that I needed to make sure that I and I was also nervous, right? I was I was away from my family and um, I was actually stuck in um, stuck. It's not a it's not a bad place to be stuck, but I was stuck in Cambodia while Mikey was trying to figure out really what was happening. So I was touching base with my team through Zoom um, every day uh, and just trying to create some sort of calm for them that, hey, this is, you know, we're we're going to get through this. We have to kind of figure out the business right now because it was also, you had to be compassionate about what they were going through as a human, but also we had to, we had to really make some hard, fast decisions. I would say as it, I was uh, Nike, uh, shipped kind of all the expats back to their home country. So I was put back in, in the US and I was actually stuck in the US for eight months. And as we all know, it played out in the US. It was um, equally as uh, challenging to be a leader during that time, especially for a community that um, felt so out of touch what was going on within the US um, with uh, the racial injustice and and obviously within Nike that that you know and in the U.S. and being an American, it's a huge turning point for us as a as a community and as, as a um, culture at Nike that we need to stand up for what what is correct and what is right. So leading a team through that time too is um, was a great I would say learning experience for me um, especially with my own white privilege and, and learning you know my own personal journey so I think I I took it upon myself to help educate my community back in Asia of, 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 um, of a team to understand hey this is what's happening in the US and we're an American brand and it it's something that matters so this year has been a growing year, I would say, as a leader um, to get through, not get through, but to um, help lead a team through some pretty difficult times because our, our country is, and and as being an American brand, we, we're going through a lot, um, but all for the good and we're going to, we're going to do better in the future. So COVID is, uh, I would say, the, this was the starting point, but it, and you know, we, we're continuously learning throughout all of it. But I think that that's a great question. It was a huge growth moment for me as a leader. Thank you. I actually have um, one more question. So yes. how are actually on this? Um, I'm planning on moving abroad like at the end of this um, year. Um, and great. I was just wondering like coming from like the US, like what was the whole like visa like process for you like trying to get over to China? Um, yeah, what was that like for you? Yeah. Well, um, the great thing about working for a big corporation is that they handle all of that. <laughs> so I actually, um, I, I, I know it's a pretty uh, tenuous process. Um, and I, you know, I was lucky enough to have Nike manage all of that. And I was just told kind of when to show up, when, when to, you know, send in your passport and, and stuff like that. But but I know that specifically China right now with everything going on with COVID, um, it's quite difficult. We actually have uh, teammates and executives that are stuck in the U.S. still. Um, that one in particular, she's our CFO. Um, she she has dual citizenship, and she's but she is a Chinese nationalist, and she actually can't get back into China either because of visa issues. So it's challenging to come to Asia right now, but I would not say if Asia's on your list, it's gonna, the world will open up soon. We have to, right? The world, um, we're, we're a global economy. So I, you know, I would say right now is challenging, but in the future, it's, I, I don't believe it's that difficult. Okay. Especially so big course. Yeah, of course. Um, Josie, I saw your hand go up and then I saw you got kicked out. I don't know if you have connection. Uh, yeah, I just restarted actually. Okay. Um, so I guess my question is kind of similar to how was, but if as if you're working for a company instead of starting your own. Um, I've worked abroad before and I think I'd like to in the future. And I was wondering like, what advice do you have for students to get there? Like did working for Nike in Oregon kind of help you transition to working abroad or what would you suggest? Yeah, 
Um, you know, I would say it. I've actually have people uh, people on my team who who some are American that moved to Shanghai right out of, right out of college, right, and uh, they just picked. Shanghai, and they wanted to, to to work there or live and work there, and they kind of there's there's those that will just make the 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 move, right? But then I would say if if you're not if you you're not some people don't ha are not that financially. I wasn't. I couldn't do anything when I first graduated college, right? I had to I had to get into the job. So if if you're not financially able to just move um, and do that on your own. My suggestion would be find companies, target companies that are global, that have global um, uh, international offices. Get in with that those brands that you're you're passionate about and that have the international experience, and then just start to. That was always what. Anytime I had um, a review or any any time that I was uh, talking to my manager. I would say I want to work internationally. I mean, that when I was working at Ralph Lauren, um, that was always a conversation. And when I got to Nike, I also would say that that hey, I'm willing to work internationally if uh, ever a role, you know, pops up, I'm I'm ready. So that and I think that is how I got to work international is through corporations. But I know others that have just moved and made it work. So it's it really is dependent on your situation. Thank you, thank you. That helps a lot. Yeah. Great. Um, great, Azat. I have you next. Yes. Uh, thank you for this huge information. Yes. Hi, I am Azat. So my question is, uh, yes, uh, I always plan to get like a more experience uh, from Asian design, Asian style. That's why I started 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 Japanese to go get more experience from there. So I um, I don't want to separate like Chinese, Asian, or South Korean. I love them all. So yes. uh, question is uh, if I plan to go for internship or even work uh, something like in the companies, if it's not like American brands or like international brand, are uh, they own companies are open for international designers or like the students even like how how you uh, just need some information about that if you have like if you know something yeah about no I mean of course um, you know I don't have that much exposure with with some of the more uh, ch like Chinese brands um, in terms of their internal makeup but I I do know that you know. The Chinese are very welcoming to and and Korean like they're very welcoming to outside um, uh, uh, opinions or outside uh, influences. So if I don't think that it would should ever hold anyone back if there's a fashion house in China, they will want to have outside experience, not within just the Asian community. Um, you know I've. I, I can't say def definitively, but I would that would be my gut that that if you are interested in any sort of Chinese brand that apply. I mean, it's not it, they're, it's worth a shot. Um, uh, I know that obviously you know the the big brands are in China in a big way, and it's it's I think probably easier maybe to infiltrate and 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 because there'll be. English will probably be the main language that's spoken. I think if you go to any Chinese brand, you're, you're if you know Mandarin, that's amazing. Um, that would probably be a language that I would learn if, if that is of interest. Um, but but I I wouldn't say that it's not an option. So thanks so much for answering. Yes, <laughs> of course. Um, Andrew, I have you, and then. I think that might be all we have time for. Hi, I'm Andrew. Nice to meet you. Thank you for speaking with us. Today. Hi. Yes. I have two questions. My first question is, what sales tactics do you think are important when it comes to expanding to new markets? Oh, interesting. Um, you know, from a sales standpoint, uh, you have to understand your consumer, right? You have to understand that base um, because the markets are different. I will say that what's 
when there's a good style, there's a good style, and that works globally. But that is like maybe ten styles. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say that the the rest are really geared more towards the consumer that of the 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 country that you're in. And I think you need to truly understand what their interests are, how they want to react with your interact with your brand, because it's all different. Um, so from a sales standpoint, if you have a brand that you're trying to sell into a country, you need to understand that demographic and that that um, that consumer base uh, and then be super sharp on where your brand fits in. Um, and I mean, that that would be kind of my strategy. I don't know if that's the right mm -hmm. strategy. but. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And then my yeah. second question is, do you have any experience merchandising for new sustainable products? And what are your thoughts and opinions about that and creating a new image for those type of products that are coming to the market now? Yeah, so I love, I mean, um, all the brands that are kind of popping up that are there that are sustainable. I think they've got, uh, I mean, it's, 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 at its core, it's the right thing to do, right? Um, I, you know, Nike, we don't do a good job at communicating to the consumer how much our product is sustainable. So I, you know, actually we were just talking about this yesterday in, in our um, selling meeting. Uh, we've got some product, you know, the, the Chinese consumer, uh, they care, Generation um, Z and Y, they care about the, the environment and 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 our um, how brands are interacting that way, but for the Chinese consumer in particular, what we're finding is that they don't want to see the kind of um, we have shoes right now that that have more of like a they look the like they're scraps right because they are it's just, it's scraps that 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 the factory has used to to create the tooling. And the Chinese consumer wants a more cleaner. So it's we're now giving feedback to our global counterparts on, hey, sustainability is important to the Chinese consumer, but but they want it to look differently. Mm -hmm. So I think the 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 way that we come to market and the way that the consumer interacts with sustainable product can be and probably will be different. But at the core, I think every generation and every consumer around the globe, it matters. And I think the brands that are really attacking it and standing for it are are probably going to lead us in that whole movement. But every brand needs to be sustainable. It, no one can get out of it. Because, um, you know, the apparel industry, it's the biggest waste, right, um, all for the environment. And um, it's doing the most damage. So those that are in the apparel industry really need to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your feedback. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kate. This uh, two-part interview has been great, and we really, really appreciate you being flexible with us and, and hearing so much about Shanghai and Asia and Nike. and, and Yes. <laughs> no, thank you guys so much for having me. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. So, yes, I wish you guys all the best of luck. You're going to do great. <laughs> Thank you, and you too, 2021, and have a great Tuesday. <laughs> Thank Thanks so you. Much. You guys Thank have a great you. night. Uh, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I put into the chat room the survey for this week. Please be sure to fill it out for your attendance. And if anyone has any questions, I'm here. Thank you. Thanks, Thank guys. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, you're welcome. Have a good week. Thank you. You too. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Professor, can I get your opinion on something? Absolutely. So, um, <laughs> sorry, repeat that again. Or do you want to talk here or privately? We can talk privately. That's okay. Yeah, sure. Um, you know what? Let's talk about speaking, right? Let me let me do a break after with you. Okay. Does anyone else have anything before I leave? Yeah, I'm
uh, professor, did you say there's like a question like um, the yeah. uh, questionnaire? Oh, where's the link? It's uh, in the chat. Uh, uh, I don't see it. I, I couldn't find it. You know? Oh, yeah. Thank you. No problem. Mm-hmm. 